All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So uh, just to start off with, this is work that I did with the Nature Conservancy this summer, and by uh, lead scientist Chelsea Beebe, who is the main driver of this. And so just looking at invasive species in general, invasive species can have a lot of really negative impacts. There's thousands of different species that have been introduced to a lot of different areas of the world. Um, and many of these species will have significant detrimental impacts in those novel ecosystems that they're now joining and becoming a part of. And as they do, uh, these species can be parts of many different groups as they cause these effects. So you can see, you can see a few examples here of a plant, an insect, and an amphibian. So many different groups that can be part of these very common and very detrimental invasive species. And the, some commonalities between them is that they'll typically be R selected, so they'll have a lot of young very fast. They'll be very successful competitively, so they'll be able to outcompete those native species that they're in the same ecosystem as. And they'll be generalists, so using a lot of different habitats and a lot of different food sources to kind of take advantage of these resources. So what happens when one of those invasive species is a fungus? So looking at white nose syndrome, this is a fungus that lives exclusively on chiropterans or bats. You can see evidence of it right here on the nose, it's white, of this bat. This is a little brown bat from the East Coast where it was first discovered in 2006 in North America. You can see this little X mark right here in upstate New York, which represents the first occurrence of white nose syndrome in North America. And this gradient of the map from light to dark blue shows that continual spread as it would move throughout the different years with the most recent three years represented in yellow, orange, and red. And so this fungus on the East Coast has killed millions of different bats of different species. What it does is it's a cold adaptive fungus. And so during the cold seasons, it will grow on these bats and cause them to wake up from their hibernation, which will result in them either freezing to death or dying due to a lack of resources available at the time. And so millions of bats on the East Coast have died of this and populations have been shown to crash in a lot of different areas. Now in Colorado, as you may have noticed, white nose syndrome just occurred within the last few years as being shown there. I believe it was 2022 that it was noted in the first at the first time. Right here in Northwest Colorado, Route County, would be that area where it was shown to first occur, um, which is one of the furthest west occurrences of white nose syndrome at the moment in North America. While there's been some other introductions in the Rocky Mountain region, this is one of the first also to represent the uh, western slope of the Continental Divide, which is a big deal because it puts at risk a lot of new species of bat that are endemic just to the western United States or western area of the continent. So there's a lot of species that are potentially being exposed to this fungus for the first time and are at risk of seeing significant population crashes. And as I mentioned, it's right here in the Yampa River, right along, right along that zone. So what we did to kind of study this was we established two ultrasonic monitors on Carpenter Ranch, which is a nature conservancy preserve in the Yampa River Valley. It's right in a riparian forest. We established them in two clearings where bat activity was expected to be high. And, we're and they're able to record bat passes throughout the night. They're active from a half hour before sunset until a half hour after sunrise. And during that span, we'll record any indication of a bat occurrence as it flies by. And so each of these passes will be recorded and data will be collected and stored on this system. And we had this, these, two, these two monitors active from June 14th until September 10th of this year was our active span. So about three months over this past summer. And then as we collected this data, analysis was conducted using the R, the Kaleidoscope software, which is designed to be able to automatically ID these bat calls. It's able to compare the calls that it takes in to known calls that you can see here of a bat and see which species it best lines up with in order to best identify the species and provide an identification to us. So what we did was have a group of 13 species that were expected to occur in this area that we then plugged into the software and allowed it to ID from. Those uh, species were provided with help from the Colorado National Heritage Program, the scientists from there, and data from their website. And species that didn't fit any of those groups were either provided into the no ID or noise category, depending on what they were. And these calls can represent a number of different types of bad communications. Sometimes those can be echolocation calls or hunting, and also uh, social calls from the species as well. And then further temporal analysis was conducted using R. So these are our results of the 13 species. All of them were recorded at least once in that span. 
So at least one pass was attributed to each species. Of them, 11 were given a significant p-value by Kaleidoscope. It's able to give a value based on what it expects, based on the, the ability to identify this species and its confidence. So 11 of these species were shown to have at least 95% confidence in their occurrence. Of them, you can see a few here are still listed as unlikely. I want to point out a few specific examples here. So the Western red bat is one species that we were seeing with very significant results in this area. Um, the software seemed very confident in its occurrence. However, it's never before been recorded within the state of Colorado. And so it's listed as unlikely because this occurrence could potentially represent the first record of this species within the state. And so this is one species to note as a potential outlier. Another one is the big free tail bat here, which was given a significant p-value. However, only seven individual recordings were attributed to this species, and it's likely they were actually a sound like a truck brake that was instead given to this species. Um, and then a few other species that listed as possible or unlikely here are just ecologically unusual due to the uh, habitat or the elevation that we were recording this data at. So to look at those calls that we identified, you can see uh, on the x-axis here, each individual species, and on the y-axis, the count of how many passes were attributed to each individual species. And so you can see the little brown bat by far dominated the system. Over 15,000 calls were attributed to that species alone, whereas the two species without significant p-values, Townsend's Beaker's bat and Bridget's Iotis, you can see have very little occurrences, and the big free-tailed bat I mentioned before is once again very low. So for that reason, those three species were left off of future analysis. All other species you can see are around a similar range of occurrence. So looking at these species temporally, you can see on the x-axis here, time scale within a given night, so from the hour of 2100 or 9 p.m. until 6 a.m. in the morning, you can see bat activity from all species grouped together, so number of counts at each given time. And so looking at that, you can see that there was a significant peak just after sunset and just before sunrise of bat activity, which fits with known activity of bats within the literature. However, as we saw before, this graph is by far dominated by one species. So if you break it down, that's basically just a graph of a little brown bat. <laughs> Sorry. And so, looking here, you can see all the other species have much lower counts and potentially different uh, occurrences within that span instead. We're looking at basically the same graph of species. And so moving along, we can look at the graphs instead with each individual species and see that most do still occur with significant peaks right around sunset, a lot of these species will either be right at or just after sunset. And then you can also see there's a very different y-axis for a number of them. Little brown bat is upwards of 5,000 individuals, whereas others don't range beyond 60. And you can also see that only a few of these species have secondary peaks around sunrise, like we were noting in the graph earlier. And so temporally, uh, that's one occurrence of these species. Now looking at their occurrences seasonally, you can look instead at the scale from July or from June, excuse me, until September, and see how these species would occur in that span. And so a lot of species are present pretty consistently throughout that. You can see a little brown bat here, uh, once again, having a very kind of consistent occurrence while up and down throughout it. Whereas other species, like the pallid bat or the longer myotis, will have peaks in the beginning or end of the season, implying that they may simply be migrating through the system rather than consistent residents of this habitat throughout the year. And so that's one other uh, important note. And so, just to recap, we saw that many species were active in the same periods of night around sunset, with many having the secondary peak at sunrise. We saw that migration was occurring in this system with peaks in June and August, representing different species coming through. And we saw little brown bat by far dominating the system, with many other species also present, but at very much lower levels. And so, what does that mean for white nose syndrome? Well, this graph here by Vanderwolf et al. will show an analysis of these western bat species and looking at their potential uh, resistance to white nose syndrome. And of them you can see there's not very many species with any level of resistance here. Um, a lot of species are very susceptible to its effects, including a lot of the species we saw. And so pallid bat and the species in the genus Myotis especially are some of these very vulnerable species that have been shown to decrease on the east coast where they occur, and new species on the west coast are likely to suffer same and similar effects and likely show specific decreases. As that occurs, however, species like the big brown bat and hoary bat have been shown on the East Coast, where they're also present, to be much less susceptible to the white nose syndrome. They've actually been shown to increase in some areas where big brown bat and other myota species have decreased, 
This was showing an ecological shift occurring that may be in the future for the West Coast as well, as we see this continual kind of population decreases from White Nose Syndrome. It's also important to note, once again, this migration that we saw, could it be indicative of species being carriers? So hoary bat, despite being known to be less susceptible to the fungus, has been shown to carry it in some uh, instances, and so can have, can have the fungus despite not having effects of it. And so as it and other species migrate through, it could be one potential way that this fungus is moving into and out of systems and be continuing its spread. So looking into the future impacts of that, it's really important to know about those transmission patterns. And so it's still a big question how the fungus is moving continually westward. Like I mentioned, there's potentially carrier species that are moving it as they migrate, but it also may be through a hibernation colonies as species get together and split apart during winter months, or due to human influence as it's been known to grow on people's shoes and gear after visiting different caves. And so that's another important thing to know about its potential spread. It's also important to look at the migration patterns of these potential carrier species. A lot of their patterns are not well known at all. The hoary bat has been seen as far south as the Yucatan during its winter months, but it's not known exactly what route it takes or where different groups may be coming from to arrive in the area. And so knowing exactly how that migration may be occurring and this fungus may be spreading is a very important aspect. With our given study area, it would also be very important to look into the western red bat and big fruit of that as some of our outliers to better understand what these species may be, uh, be looking at in terms of their actual presence. And it would be very important to continue monitoring our populations that we know of, we know of as having white nose syndrome and see if we can either reduce the spread or mitigate those effects as, the, as time goes on. With that, I'd like to acknowledge Chelsea Beebe, who's the main driver of this research, and the Nature Conservancy as a whole, who I collected this data with and for, uh, Brian Linkhart as a thesis advisor, and Dr. Flav Flavia Sancier Barbosa, who helped me with R in the statistics department here, and the entire BAT team at the Carl National Heritage Program, who were able to help assist me with identifying species and having the list known of what we were looking at. With that, I can take questions. <laughs> Do some bats call more than others? And if so, is that factored into those occupancy estimates? Or is it like just that the frequency of calls is like a pretty fair proxy for abundance? Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> it will differ a little bit by species for sure. While echolocation patterns will be somewhat similar as bats hunt, uh, social characteristics of different species can definitely be very unique. A lot of uh, colony bats and cave roosting bats, such as the myotis, will be more, more uh, social than species like the hoary bat, which are tree roosters and solitary roosters at that. And so those species will be very distinct from one another in terms of how they may interact. I'm not sure that the uh, software puts that into, into account per se. It just records what species it picks up. Another question about that, about abundance, is whether it's able to pick up uh, louder sounds, so bigger bats will be louder typically across a larger scale and therefore be linked in that way as well with larger bats being picked up more quickly than smaller bats due to their being able to be heard farther distances. And so that's another question there, but there's definitely a lot of work to be done in terms of standardizing those sort of abundances and calls to determine which species may actually be most common. Uh, Cindy? Yeah, great talk, really interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the So what they did was they found links for uh, these two kind of things within bats. So uh, this other type of uh, uh, fungus or microbial bacteria and yeast within, within bats that could actually work as a way to prevent white nose syndrome and reduce susceptibility. And what they did was collect a number of species of bat from the wild in the West Coast. And you can see these are percentages of individuals that are shown to be susceptible. So from, I believe this one here is our pallet bat, Anthrosus pallidus, and you can see 
that's probably about 95% are susceptible of individuals that they were able to look at in this study. And they did that with a group of species from the West Coast. Not all species I saw in my study are represented here. Uh, we could see pallid bat and then a lot of my other species, the species of the Lazarus genus, for instance, the silver hair bat, horny bat, and uh, red, red bat are not left out of the study. And so there's a lot more species to be looked at in terms of which ones are susceptible. But that's basically what they're looking at, is just percentage of population. Yeah, Shane. So it sounds like some of that susceptibility is a kind of an interaction with the microbiome and the, yeah. of, of the bat. Has there, has there been some evidence, too, that uh, some of these bats have uh, evolved, increased uh, uh, resistance in the, with their immune systems or anything like that? Is that going on as well? I think there have been, um, at least to some degree. I know on the East Coast, a lot of these species of myotis have died off because they actually have much longer lifespans than one would anticipate, and so adaptation is not super feasible. Some species of little brown bat have known to live upwards of 25 years, some individuals, and so it doesn't work very well with a fungus that was introduced less than 20 years ago and has now spread across these coasts. And so while adaptation hasn't been huge, there's definitely some individuals that are resistant and are still maintaining populations in some caves on the East Coast. And other species, such as the big brown bat, have been shown to be adapted to surviving it. That was one that people originally theorized would be susceptible because they are a hibernatory bat, and typically the division there is hibernatory versus migratory, as to which one would be susceptible due to the cold adaptations of the fungus. But despite being a cold adapted fungus, or a hibernatory bat, the big brown bat has been shown to be relatively uh, less susceptible to this fungus, relatively resistant, and so, that's one question where it would be worth looking into more about how it's able to adapt and survive. And then that's of the genus Myotis within the original range of white syndrome in the Mediterranean are fully resistant to it. Um, where it exists in, in there, people have seen white nose syndrome growing on bats in caves in the Mediterranean of the same genus and of other species without having any kind of detrimental effects. Populations there are totally consistent with its occurrence. And so there's potential that it may adapt in the future, but it's yet to be seen with North American bats. Cool, thank you. Yeah, right. So, William, uh, sociality, of course, is associated with infection rates as well, mm -hmm. but it's to say group roosting. Can you, right. can you address the sociality of the 13 species in Western Colorado and identify, you know, on the basis of, of that, is it likely to contribute to their susceptibility, or are a lot of them solitary roosters here? Yeah, so from this group, we can see most of the myotis genus, so let's say small-throated, long-eared, little brown, fringe, or long leg, will all be social roosters. And so they'll li live in colonies and houses and caves in this other sort of area where they're likely to transmit the fungus. And they're also all hibernatory. And so during those cold seasons, they can even roost together with between species. And so it can be one way that the fungus is moving between them. The Lazarus genus, so western red bat, horny bat, and silver-haired bat, are all tree roosters and solitary. And so they will be less likely to transport this fungus and then be linked to one another. Of these other species, pallid bat are also typically uh, solitary roosters, as are towers of the big eared bat, where big brown bat is a group rooster, and big free tailed bat and Mexican free tailed bat actually lives in the largest colonies of any bat anywhere. The largest colony of bats in the world in Texas is a Mexican free tailed bat, where there's over 15 million. And so there. <laughs> So they're a very, very solid uh, social group, um, and big free tail bat will fit the same uh, idea as them as well. So there's a lot of potential for movement within them. Mexican free tail bat is another species that migrates, and so they're less susceptible due to that fact because they'll live in more temperate environments um, or more tropical environments due to the winter months where they're less likely to grow the cold adapted fungus, and so. Um, those two factors are more of the major kind of linked, linked groups, is the sociality and the migratory versus hibernatory adaptations of these different species. Yeah, I'm saying.
Yeah. Uh, theoretically, climate change could be beneficial for these bat populations and actually reduce this, this fungus, yeah. Um, because it's cold adapted, it only grows in the winter months. It'll lie dormant throughout the summer, and then in the winter, grow on these bats and kind of take over them. You can see evidence of it in the summer just by seeing scarring on bats, but they won't actually show any evidence of the fungus because it won't be present. Um, but yeah, climate change could be theoretically beneficial in this, in this, uh, in this case, which is a very interesting kind of component here. But at the rate that it's spreading and decimating these populations, it's likely it won't get the chance to. A lot of these species, even the little brown bat, which you saw very heavily here, and is by far the most common species of bat in North America, some researchers have estimated its extinction for within the next 10 years, um, just as this fungus spread and continues to kill a lot of these individuals. And so it's likely that the fungus will kind of take hold of a lot of these populations before climate change can even have its, its impact. Yeah? Sort of in line with that, um, with that remark, given that uh, our little brown bat, our Myotis lucifugus, um, is so dominant here in the near study region, if we saw a severe population decline there, would, what bat species do you think would fill that ecological niche? Right. So the one we've seen primarily fill that role on the east coast has been the big brown bat. As you can see on uh, this graph, that is the second most common species here. and so. That may potentially be evidence of that already happening, or that may simply be that it's a very common species that's going to be in this area. We could also see hoary bat or a few of these other species take over. It's not yet known which species from the West Coast may be the most resistant, and so it's possible the species like the silver-haired bat or the Western red bat that haven't been exposed to it before could be somewhat capable of putting up uh, resistance to this fungus and growing in their populations to replace, but the, my money's on the big brown bat. That's the one that we've seen in this case. Uh, continuing to kind of see that trend on the west coast as well. Um, but that's yet to be determined as, as this fungus kind of takes hold in this novel ecosystem. Awesome, thank you, Josh. Um, do we have any questions on the zoo over there, Pike? That's like my favorite thing no. so far. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I think that might be that then. Thanks for